Chapter 9, A Noggin of Tea You could see Worth had something on his mind when he came home this afternoon. He kept his eyes from Sayward getting ready to boil soap tomorrow in the big kettle outside. Oh, when he went out to the run to wash, he growled like usual how they never boiled soap till they ran out. But after supper he went and oiled his fine paper window, tallowed the wooden hinges of the door, so they'd stop their holding back and screeching, and trimmed up a rock to fit the hole a log had knocked in the fireplace wall. Don't you have any better short gown than that? He came right out at supper time, looking critically at Sayward across the trencher. It made it plain even to little Sully that something out of the common run had come over their pappy. Once Jenny opened her mouth, like she would ask him about it, but Sayward pulled down her mouth at her and nodded her to go on and eat her supper. A man's mind had stranger and darker ways than a beast in the woods. You could poultice a body, wound, or a snake bite, and it would draw the poison out, but try and do that to a woodsy's mind, and you only drove it in. No, you had to bide your time and go about your business. When it ripened like a felon, it would come out of its own self, if it was to come. It passed through Sayward's head that her father might be fixing to fetch a woman home to take Jerry's place, but it had no free white women in this country that she knew of and hardly would he spruce up his cabin for a Shawnee or Delaware wench. It would be grand enough for her as it was. Before he went to bed, he poured fresh powder in his horn and told her he wanted his breakfast early, for he failed to get meat that day. And yet, long after breakfast next morning, it seemed he couldn't take himself off. Jenny fetched word out to say word at her kettle that he still squatted on his haunches by the fire, melting lead in his iron ladle and pouring it in the funnel of his mold till it ran over. All the young ones had watched this so often they could tell their own selves by the change of color when the bullet had cooled and it was time to open the wooden handles, throw it out, and pour in more. Later, when those balls cooled a bit, he would cut off the sprues with his knife. Well, Sayward told herself, he couldn't hold off and run balls all day. After a while, she saw him with his rifle, horn, and bullet pouch coming from the cabin. Yes, he was heading her way. Now, like as not, this thing would come out. She moved around the kettle a speck and kept her back toward him, for a look in his face might scare those words ready on his lips and drive them back in his mind. I come by those new squatters yesterday, he began roughly, just to bid them the time. Sayward calm as a June morning, went on stirring the soap with her paddle, while Jenny and Sully came up soundlessly to stand around with big ears. She gave me something called tea, Worth said, Oh, her man was there with her all the time. He added quickly to stop any wrong thoughts that might be in his eldest, eldest girl's head. You mean Dittany, Jenny ventured. No, it was nothing like that, Worth growled. 
Well, what fur thing was it? Sayward asked him. Worth's face grew heavy. Near as I could make out, it was some kind of snack, betwixt dinner and supper. It wasn't a meal, and it wasn't a piece. A cup of tea went with it. What was it she gave you to eat? Sayward put to him without looking up. I never paid no attention. Well, you have some idea. Worth pondered. Had it been meat, he could have told you the kind of game, the part of the carcass cut from, whether young or old, and how long it had been hung to ripen. But this was woman stuff. It made him feel kind of sheepish just to talk on it. It put me in mind, he said shortly, of the play party rations Jerry had once when I came a courtin. Could you take it up in your fingers? Jenny was keen to know. Or did you need your knife to eat it with? Worth threw her a look from the whites of his eyes. The tea, she said, come from Chiny. The rest was just this and that. I mind she had two kinds of breadstuffs, but never a bite of meat or gravy. What was her breadstuffs like? Oh, I got nothing for such, Worth stormed, and I can tell ya it was cut up, small and scanty, like for little uns. The chiny tea was tasty, I'll warrant, Jenny said impressed. I'd as soon drunk water out of a spring some leaves fell in, he grunted. Did you notice the cup she gave you? Oh, I took notice, Worth grumbled. It was that thin crockery. I was afraid it'd break in my fingers. Sayward made a face at them to jog at their father no more. Well, she knew how woodsy men hated to get jockeyed into drinking tea or coffee, let alone talk about it. They claimed such slops never stuck to the ribs. Well, I'm off, he said shortly. At the big white oak he turned. I mind now, Sayard, he called back. This woman asked about you. She said she might be up this way a visitin', maybe today. When the trees had swallowed him up, the young ones studied their eldest sister's face. I note it all the time, little Sully spoke up. Wise as an owl. Oh, her father could go, Sayward told herself, for it was out now. It was plain as the nose on his face why he wanted off this place today. She might have expected it had to do with these Covenhovens just up around the bend. The young ones said they were rich, and it must be, for they had three cows and two horses and had fetched a whole raft of plunder in hickory wythe creels on those tamed beasts' backs. The young ones had lain up in the bushes and watched them unpack. Jenny said they had pewter and copper ware, a looking glass with a towel they hung on a tree, more pots and kettles than you could shake a stick at, a grindstone and a grubbing hoe, and that wasn't half of it. They had two chests, fine patched quilts, a big iron shovel, and a small one Jenny thought for the fire, a candle mold, reels, a flax, and spinning wheel, and the woman had all the bushes airing with skirts, breeches, petticoats, bedgowns, and sheets like great folks had. The walls of the Luckett cabin, Sayward expected, would look mighty bare of clothes to such a woman. What rations can you give a body so fine? Jenny wanted to know. I'll have to set my thinking cap, Sayward told her. Standing over her big kettle, she thought, how handier than any time yet would her mother come in if she were living? 
never could Worth mind anything save it had to do with the woods. But Jerry could tell ya all the houses she ever went in, the special victuals they gave her, and how she figured they were made. The last year Jerry puttered around like she didn't know her own name, but that old head was still a larder and storbin of most anything about folks and settlements you wanted to know. Jerry would be a comfort to her oldest girl now. She would sit here and reel right off how to give this thing called tea in front of a lady. But Jerry wasn't here and it filled no kettles to wish her back. Sayward reckoned she would have to do it herself. She kept on cooking and stirring. That soap till it dripped thick from her paddle. Then she went in and read out the cabin. She was glad she had set sourdough to rise that morning. Only yesterday, Wyatt said he knew where it had early yellow lady slippers, and she had him fetch some for Jenny to stick in cracks between the logs. She told him to fetch a long fresh mint and cucumber tree leaves, for they made it smell good and welcome over a swept dirt floor. Now she washed her face, hands, and feet at the run, combed her hair, and put on her good short gown. All she lacked was a pair of cowhide shoes, but since she had none, she reckoned her feet would have to go naked. Somebody a comin Wyatt hissed in at the door a little while after dinner. The young ones, even Jenny, big as she was, raced out and dove in the brush. Oh, Sayward knew they would manage to peek in through the cracks and see her and the visiting lady, but never would the lady see hide nor hair of them, nor would Sayward either till it was all over with and the company gone. She set the door open, a speck, and propped it with no fireplace log, but a pretty white rock she had Sully fetch in. This was a stylish way. Jerry used to say, folks would do along the Constoga. After a while she heard voices on the path. I don't believe anybody's home, a woman's voice said. Now you come this far, you go on in, a man told her. Smoke's a-coming from the chimney. The woman must have stood out there a little while, looking around, her steps made plainly by cobbler's shoes with heels, crunched up to the door log. For the first time since that door had been swung, knuckles wrapped on the heavy puncheons. You could tell this company wasn't a woodsy, for no woodsy would think themselves fine enough to knock on door. Sayward waited for a seemly time to pass. Then with grave face and bare feet she moved to the door. A gentle, pock-faced woman stood there in elegant blue calico with yellow flowers figured through. A plump little woman, light-footed and light-complected, although you couldn't see her hair under the fine sunbonnet. Sayward guessed she had worn it just to set herself off, for there was no sun in these woods. The woman took in each other with their eyes. I'm your neighbor up the river a piece, the caller said. Can't you come in? Your man, too, Sayward added, although she knew by what he said he had taken the trouble to come down here just to show his woman the way. He has to go back and keep a watch on our things. We got a good many, Miss Covenhoven said delicately. I'd be proud if you sat down and made yourself to home, Sayward told her. The woman's blue calico rustled to a stool on one side of the room 
and Sayward took one on the other. Here they sat for a fitting time, in sedate silence. It certain was a pleasant thing, Sayward told herself, to feel a woman's company in the cabin again. I thought we'd get rain a little while back, Miss Coven Hoven spoke. Oh, we'll get some one of these times. You are getting settled all right. Well, good as can be expected. It don't do no good to complain. No, you just got to juke it till the storm's over. I had the idea you had brother and sisters. I reckon they're off in the woods right now, Sayward told her gravely. Outside, you could hear a twig snap close to the cabin, and Sayward expected those young ones were sneaking up to peek through a crack and make faces like the collar. Well, she said, I'll start a gittin' you some tea, if it's all the same to you. Oh, I don't want you to go to any trouble, Miss Covenhoven told her. It's no trouble, Sayward said. My big kettle has soap in, but I ain't a usin' the other. I could loan you one, the pock-faced lady offered. Oh, I can do all I want with one. Sayward took the small kettle and used it the first time to fry out bear's bacon for shortening she would need later on. Almost warm enough for a body to wash their hair, she said. She used that kettle a second time to bake sourdough biscuits in, after she had poured the shortening in a gourd. You and your man have a mess of poke yet, she made talk again. It has plenty around. When the biscuits were done, she used the kettle a third time to fry the shortcake in, first working the fresh shortening in the dough until it was ready. Pap got such a nice silver fox last winter, she said, I wish you could have seen it. Now she took the kettle a fourth time and used it as a bucket to draw and fetch water from the spring. I heard your man's a puttin' up a double cabin. Not that one room isn't big enough for us, Miss Covenhoven explained modestly. No, one room's got plenty room for the six of us, Sayward agreed. When the kettle started to simmer, she used it a fifth time as a teapot, putting in a lick of dittany and sassafras root shavings. Then she poured out a pair of steaming wooden cups and set them with her two bread stuffs on the trencher. Oh, if this woman could give worth two kinds of bread stuffs at one time, Sayward would give her no less. In truth, she would go her one better, for her sourdough biscuits were not fine and scanty, but of a hearty size with a square of smoked bear's bacon set in the top of each to run down over the sides and bake with a tasty crust. Tea's done, she said gravely. You can draw up your stool. This tea thing, Sayward told herself, wasn't as bad as she had looked for. The biscuits and shortcake were real good. The spicy dittany, steam rose. Through it passed their women's talk, with quiet spots between, for two neighbors living so close shouldn't tell all they knew, or what would they have to talk about next time. Dusk was running through the woods when she tramped partway home with her company. Her father, she told herself, would have to wait for his supper tonight. Oh, she knew he was back this long time. 
He could keep himself hid like the young ones, but he couldn't keep the stink of his old clay pipe under some bush. Don't your sisters and brother stay out pretty late in the woods? Miss Covenhoven wondered. Oh, they ain't that far off. They can't find their way home, Sayward said. In her mind, she could see them in the cabin this minute fighting over the leavings of the tea. Big John Covenhoven came through the woods to meet his woman. I need somebody to fetch home my cows, he said. By the month, maybe your brother'd want to talk to me about it. I had such a nice visit, Miss Covenhoven told Sayward. Now don't wait till our cabin's up till you come over. Sayward thought on the path home it was strange about new places and people. At first they had their strange look. Then gradually they changed. Later on, when you thought about that first way they looked, it didn't seem like the same place or person anymore. This neighbor woman she had known only one afternoon, and already she had an old-time look in Sayward's mind. It was dark till she got to the cabin. She reckoned it must be true she took after her mother's side of the house, for a woman's comfort in another woman still lingered in her bones. Now, after a fitting time, she would take herself over some afternoon to return the visit. Likely, she would see for herself those fine bread stuffs worth talked about and the china tea that he said tasted no more than water in the fall when leaves fell into the spring. Chapter 10 Mortal Sweet Jenny was getting pretty as a picture. You could see she wasn't a young one any more like the others. Oh, sometimes she'd rip and tear around with them, play fox and hounds, blow bubbles through Joe Pye Weed in the run, or march up and down with sharp blades of wood grass held tight between cupped hands, and other times she spurned those young ones' company like they had just crawled out of their log cradles. Today, Asha wanted her to race terrapins, but do you think Jenny would? No, she had nothing for such doings today. She sat by herself on the cabin bench, her bare white legs twined around each other, singing to herself, the sadder the sweeter. Wyatt and Sully hung around, for they could listen to their sister Jenny singing all day. Now Asha didn't think so much of it. She's got one of her spells on again, she jeered in her man's voice to say word. Jenny paid her no notice. Asha didn't care how hot were the coals she fetched to lay on her pet terrapin's back to make it run faster. Jenny would sooner make music. A song or hymn stuck to her mind like rows of beggar lice to her skirt. Let her hear it once and she knew it by heart. When she didn't recollect a line, she made one up and nobody knew the difference. She didn't know herself any more which were the real words and which the made up. She's lonesome as a morning dove. I can't even look at her. Asha complained and went out. Today Jenny sang most everything she knew. True Thomas and Greenland's Icy Mountings, Sinclair's Defeat, and Purty Polly, Who's Afraid, and some others. Fly Up, she sang over twice. That was a mighty short song, but she liked it best. 
villets in the holler, poke greens in the dish, bluebird fly up, give me my wish, haycocks in the meter, cherries in the dish, red bird fly up, give me my wish, chestnuts in the treetops, pumpkin in the dish, brown bird fly up, give me my wish, ice in the river, possum in the dish, snowbird fly up, give me my wish. Jenny was thinking she would like to taste possum again. It had none here in these deep woods like it had close to the settlements. Then Asha's face, dark as an Indian's, was stuck in at the door. You got your wish, she jeered. The bound boys here again. Jenny slowly unwound her legs. You couldn't believe Asha half the time, but when she peeked out the door, Jake Tench and the bound boy were coming along the path. Jake had dressed up in a Rorum hat, and the bound boy's reddish hair was tied behind with a ribbon snipped off a bolt of blue strouting. Don't you dare tell where I'm at or I'll maul ya, Jenny warned Asha, and her white legs flew up the ladder to the loft. She threw herself out of sight on Sully's bed, for that was the farthest back from the hole so the littlest body of them all might not tumble down in the cabin should she roll in her sleep. The roof slanted down close above. You had to be careful how you raised up, or you got a good smack on your head. She could hear Jake Tench's moccasins scraping over the dirt floor. He came in their cabin of late like he owned it. Jenny couldn't go him. He put her in mind of the black he bear she and Sayward had once watched out in the woods trying to please a she bear. He moved about playful and frolic some on his legs, but his paws were powerful as all get out, and his little black eyes danced with the de devilment he'd do once he got you and them. She lay there, hating to be penned up with him down there. Once she dragged herself to the loft hole to see if her oldest sister was all right. Sayward bent by the fire, scraping back ashes to bake cornbread on the hearth. Jake was bragging how he fixed a copper snake. It had caught him on the shank so he held it down with a forked stick and spat tobacco spittle in its mouth. By night, Jake said he had overed the spittle of the snake, but the copper snake was stiff as a poker. Yes, he could stand the poison of a copper snake, but the copper snake couldn't stand his. Oh, he was feeling high today when Sayward put the hot ashes back over her bread. He squirted tobacco juice halfway across the cabin to that fire. Jenny saw Sayward's face flush up, but she didn't say anything. If it had been worth now, Jenny thought Sayward would have stopped him short enough. She heard the bound boy coming to the door. Where's Jenny at, Sayard? Ain't she outside a matchin' terrapins? I can't see her. Well, you look on around a piece and see if you can't find her. Jenny felt a glow of affection for Sayward. She stood by you. Wyatt would get streaks like his father. Asha would turn on you like an Indian. Sully was too little to be of much account and Jerry was half rotted away in her berry hole, but you could count on Sayward. She never went back on you. She was far too good for Jake Tench. Oh, Jenny knew well enough 
what he was coming around here for. First thing, Sayward knew she'd have to live with him, whether she wanted to or no. Worth said already it had half-blood young ones in Shawnee Town. They were blaming on Jake Tench. Jenny wouldn't want to be around if Sayward ever had a young one by that old rip to rock or tote such would go against her grain. <clears throat> like as not, it would have some delish birthmark of its pappy as the wolf Jake skinned alive or the wagoner's nose he claimed he bit off once in a fisticuff. After a while, the bound boy came back to the door. I can't find her nowheres, Sayard, he complained. Jenny didn't like the sound of Jake Tench's laugh. Maybe she's up in the loft awaitin' for ya, he said. Oh, she knew now she should have lain still as a log in Sully's bed and never dragged herself over to the loft hole. She heard the bound boy crossing the cabin. She raised up and down that ladder she went, holding her dress low and tight between her white knees as she was able. Jake Tench and Will Beagle would get no look at her if she could help it. She had a glimpse of the bound boy stopping short and staring at her with brown, astonished eyes. Then out the door she went. Jen, Will Beagle's here. Wyatt yelled from the chopping log. Jenny, the bound boy, called. But Jenny did not stop. She could hear someone running after. She looked back over her shoulder. The bound boy was coming fast as his feet could take him. She let her slim legs go. Sometimes when she was out alone in the woods, she ran for pleasure. But never could she go like when a body chased her if it was only the young ones. Something came in her thin white legs then, and she didn't know any more she had any. She didn't need to try to run. An easy power buoyed her up like the wind, and she felt she could sail off like a red bird if she wanted to. Once, when they were back in Pennsylvania, she dreamed she could fly. She hadn't any wings. She just held out her arms and floated from one mountain to another. The valley between had a square log house, a round log barn, and red top meadows. She flew over those meadows so close. The red top waved in a breeze. The folks came out of that house to watch her. She could still feel how light her body was. Her bones felt hollow as a turkey's wing. Today she ran till it felt good to walk, but she wasn't tired. The forest mold gave soft and springy underfoot. Around her stood the thousand pillars of the woods, bidding her come on. The butts of the red oaks were coated with green, but the moss would have nothing to do with the black oaks. Down by a run, a young doe lifted its head and stared at her with eyes. It was a shame to think a corby would pick out some day. It had been drinking, and the drops of water rained from its mouth. Back somewhere behind Jenny, the young ones yelled, and the doe was off. It went through the trees in great effortless jumps, cut a half circle, and when it came back to the ravine, the run was in. It sailed over like a pheasant. Jenny could hear the bound boy calling to her. Now, it came over her. She was a deer, too. The bound boy was hunting her like men always hunted women and wild things. Never would they let them be to live their own lives. No, men always came after, 
smelling and tracking them down. But the bound boy would never find her. She was a young doe. A delicious wildness came up in her. The woods looked different now. The trees and bushes, even the poison sumac, were friendly. They stood over and bent down at her and tried to hide her. You had to be a deer to know how the wild things felt when a man was after you. A stick cracked close under the bound boy's foot, and she was off like the doe. Her hair floated brown and soft behind her. Every deer she knew had its secret places where it slept out by day. <clears throat> she would go to her place now. Even Sayward didn't know where she hid herself when things around the cabin got too much to stand. She made a wide circle to throw the bound boy off the track. Then she headed for the river, and something pure came into her face. This was a holy place. She had found it herself, and never would she show it to any but her true love when he came. First, she tramped through a forest meadow of low fern that brushed soft as lace against her feet and legs. Then she came to a dark clump of pines. It hadn't many pines in this northwest territory, and mostly they stood alone. But here, in this spot, they crowded everything else out. Like the hemlocks along a Pennsylvania stream. Always, when she got this far, Jenny kept her eyes religiously down. Would it mean as much to her as last time, she asked herself. Then, when she raised her eyes, she'd know this place would never fail her. It was dim with a kind of pine woods night, and yet out there beyond the dark. Scully butts and branches, the blinding sunlight came down, turning a ferny bank to golden, tender green, and sparkling on the river with silver. Out there lay a new world. It was like something to come in her own life some day, something bright and shining on ahead. She listened. All sound of pursuit had gone. She was alone in her secret bower. It had been warm, running. The sweat seemed to stand over her body in fine beads. With a deft motion, she slipped out of her single garment and lay white and cool on the ancient brown carpet of the place. She lay on her young belly with her chin propped up in her hands, looking out into this bright new world, the like of which she'd go into some day. This was the door through which her true love would step in her life. He would carry no long woods rifle like her father, but a fine government musket, no buckskins would he wear, but bright green regimentals, or those of blue and gold. He would take her by her lily-white hand, and lead her out of these dark woods. Not on foot would they go, but riding a horse like the Covenhovens, or a river boat like George Roebuck's Pole Bateau. And when they got to the settlements, they would stop. Here they would live where folks smoothed their stools and trencher with an ads. On toward evening, she would dress like the other women and sit on her street porch to see those that went by. When she got tired, she could lie on a lounge with a panther skin coverlet and on the Sabbath she would prank herself out in a fine check apron and go to church. All afternoon she lay in this mortal sweet place while a pheasant stretched its neck this way and that above a log, trying to make out this white patch on the brown ground. 
It strutted up and down with its neck ruffed and its tail spread out and all the golden spots on its feathers stood out brighter than they ever did on the birds that Worth fetched home in his hunting shirt. The pheasant got close as it dared, then it clucked like a settlement biddy and ran to put trees between itself and this white thing before it rose. It was dusk when Jenny came down the cabin path, shy as a young she-fox. Through the open door, she could see the bound boy and the young ones fooling in the cabin. Sayward and Jake were gone. After a while, they came through the early darkness together from the direction of the post. Jenny felt herself harden toward Sayward. She didn't see how her eldest sister could do this and then go about getting supper like nothing had happened. Once in a while, Sully or Wyatt would come to the door and yell, Jenny, but Jenny never stirred from her bush. She's a hiding out or behind the log, Asha told them. Only when Jake and the bound boy had gone down the path with their shell bark flambeau bobbing in the black night did Jenny come in. You'll get no supper now, Asha jeered. I ain't a hungry, Jenny said. Wyatt fetched a lick of something yellow and sticky from the shelf and laid it in front of her on the trencher. We'll beagle brung it for you, but you wouldn't wait. What fur thing is it? She wanted to know. It's a present he give you. What's it good for? It's a kind of sweet bob. It comes from Chiny or some far place, he said. You can have it, Jenny said, and turned away, while the others fought for it. Neither would Jenny eat any of the cold leavings Sayward offered to get for her this evening. That night she lay far from her oldest sister as she could in the bed together. It felt almost like she was laying down with Jake Trench himself. She twisted first on one side and then on the other, but she couldn't sleep. What's a ailin' you? Sayward broke out at last. Jenny turned her back. You needn't talk to me after what you done. Now I done something and don't know what it was, Sayward complained. You know good enough, Jenny told her. Jake Tench. She could feel Sayward shake with quiet laughter. Don't you fret about Jake. He might make free with a Shawnee wench but he can't with me. He might marry you, Jenny said. Sayward's voice hardened. Not him, she told her shortly, nor any other man where spits in my fire when I got bread a bacon. Chapter 11. Corpse Candles. This would be a strange summer. Worth gave out. All signs the past winter had been hind foremost. It had black frost early in October that the axe couldn't chop the ground, and by New Year the little white butterflies ran on their wings through the naked woods. A dogwood bloomed on old Christmas. Jenny wanted to break off some branches and fetch them in the cabin for a nosegay, but Worth said sternly any tree that blossomed on the wrong side of the year had no good in it. Bees and flies that were foolish enough to come out now and suck its honey would die. Up on the other side of the world where the North Pole stuck out of the ice like an old chestnut stub, it had plenty of winter. More than one evening they stood outside, looking up through the bare branches, 
at the northern lights. The Shawanese called them dancing ghosts, but any white person knew it was only the midnight sun shining on the ice and snow. Red fingers kept clawing up to the middle of the heavens. One time they were here, and one time yonder. Yes, it had plenty winter up in that far place, but by that time it came down here. The snow in the clouds had melted to rain. The trees stood black and dripping when they should have been white and froze stiff as pokers. After most every rain, the sun came out like April. Snakes crawled from their dens deep down in the red shell, and hoppy toads jumped from under your feet. You couldn't tell when spring came except for the leaves. Long before the turn of summer, the woods were chock full of tiny things that buzzed and flew. Mosquitoes whined around your head like a water sawmill and millers you didn't see as a rule till late summer came in clouds out of nowhere. The river was white with them. It was a black winter worth said. Now we're getting a white summer. No human knows how this'll end up. It looked to say word that even years printed in an almanac must have off ones. Gray squirrels sometimes gave black ones. Once in a while, you heard of a white crow. Worth had shot a deer one time, pale as a ermine weasel. But such meat was tainted, and he didn't fetch any of it home. Some said you could see a white deer running through the woods on the darkest night. The spoiled flesh glowed and glurred in the dark like fox fire. Most every day now the white fog smoke lay over the bottoms. It came, Worth said, out of the wet ground and it fetched up with it all the fearsome swamp poisons. When water sinks in the ground, it cleans itself of rotten stink. Let it be green beforehand as a spotted rattlesnake's venom. So long as it keeps on sinking, it doesn't hurt any. Not even the eels and slimy things that live in the mud, for the earth is deep and has fires down in the middle to burn out what is foul. That's how spring water comes out sweet and clear. But once swamp water is drawn back out of the ground, then it fetches all the poisons with it, and everything that sucks breath has to watch out. It all comes from these plagued squatters, worth stormed. The trees they burn make smoke, the smoke makes rain, and the rain draws out the fog. The live long day, now you could hear some new squatter's axe or saw in the forest. Some hailed from Kentucky and came pulling up the river with their six-foot rifles sticking out of one end of their boats and a half-wild hog sticking its snout out of the other. A few came off Zane's trace from the old states beating what stock they had through the bush. It hadn't a cabin worth said that didn't have somebody sick in it. The swamp pestilence hung in the air night and day, and most everybody had it. Porteous Wheeler, the young Bay State lawyer who baked somewhere beyond the post, gave out calomel pills till he didn't have any for himself, and now he shook on his bad days like any person who never went to school a day in his life. The Indians came for miles to see George Roebuck shake. When the trader felt a spell coming on, 
he took off his leather apron and stood in his bare chest and back and shook till the fever stood out on him. This was the only time Sayward heard Worth speak Jerry's name in a year. Jerry, he said, would know what to do if she were alive. Jerry always had her teas and herbs hanging in the cabin to doctor with when one got sick. She'd be piling covers on when they had their chills and dosing them with hot teas to get their fever over with. But Sayward felt glad her mother wasn't here. She wouldn't like to see that worn-out body with one foot in the grave huddle against the table or log wall and shake till God Almighty would take a little pity and say she had enough. She only wished she had had the sense to ask her mother how she used to make her moss and lemon tea. Moss lemonade, Jerry would call it. Not a lemon did Jerry have or see since she married Worth Luckett, unless it was the time she went back home on a visit. But you'd swear she had cut up a whole yellow fruit that had come across the sea in a frigate from Spain. Leastwise, that's how Sayward and Jenny reckoned a lemon would taste cold or hot, nothing could cool your fever quicker, and if you set it in the run to chill, it turned into moss jelly for an ailing person to eat with the spoon. Just to think of it made a body's mouth water, but the only part of the receipt Sayward remembered was that you had to wash the moss through five waters. What moss it was, and what you did then, was forever buried now under the big white oak. Taking all together, Sayward thought they were luckier than most. They had their shakes every other day. Never were they all sick and down at the same time, with nobody to tend them or cook their rations. Some were always up and round while the others lay in their beds. Asha and Wyatt minded their sumac poison worse than their shakes. All night you could hear them squirming and scratching up in the loft. When Sayward found they were raw to their middles, she made Wyatt show himself to Worth, and Worth took a mess of sang roots to Roebuck's to trade for salt. Salt was mighty dear to have on the table, but for medicine, he reckoned, it wasn't too high. When he came back, Sayward took those two out and made them strip themselves. Then she sopped water that was salty as the sea on their legs and middles. She told herself she hadn't noticed up to now how Asha had been filling out. If she had to do it again, she'd have taken her out by herself. Not that it mattered for Asha to see Wyatt, for Asha had washed him more than once when he was little. A boy was nothing much to look at anyway. Now a girl almost filled out into a woman was different, but Wyatt never even looked at Asha. He couldn't hold still long enough for Sayward to sop the rag on a second time. The first touch of that salt on his raw parts and he would run up and down the path for all he was worth, hollering at the top of his lungs, yelling anything that came into his mouth, till the pain let up enough for Sayward to get close to him with the rag again. But Asha stood like a brown Shawnee and never let out a screech, although she was scratched, open the worse, and that, Sayward thought, was how it must have started. If Asha had run and hollered and let the poison out like Wyatt, she might have been all right. All she did was shut her teeth and drive the poison in. Oh, it fooled them for a while. Sayward blamed herself she didn't catch on sooner. She might have ciphered it out next day. 
As a rule, a body with the shakes could be down, ready to die, one time, and not long after be up and sassy as a jaybird. But Asha didn't get up after her shakes next day. She said she felt tired and expected she'd stay in her bed. And that was the last time she ever had the shakes. She lay in her loft, bed a spell, and by the time Sayward fetched her down to her and Jenny's bed, she was that gaunt, her bones stuck out. Sayward boiled May apple tea and made her drink it, scalding hot, but it never fetched out a lick of sweat. Next day, she felt a little warmer, and the next, she wouldn't take the tea now. She just lay and shut her teeth and her eyes sold up at you, defiant as a young Indian's. All she wanted was cold run water, and that she couldn't have. Give her cold water and you'll kill her, worth warned. I mind when Jerry was down with the fever. The Lancaster doctor wouldn't let her have a drop. Although it was a warm day in the woods, he kept a brisk fire going in the cabin to burn the air clean for the sick. Every time Asha moaned for water, his lips moved. By evening, Asha was the hottest sayward had ever felt a body. The heat reared up and struck you in the face when you only came near her. Worth said he couldn't make out how flesh could get that hot and not fry or burn. All through supper, Asha called for water. God Almighty, come down through the roof, boards, and fetch me some water. She yelled once. It made the young ones thirstier, but Worth touched no water for himself that night. At last, he pushed back his stool and said that before it got too dark, he'd take himself down to Roebuck's for a speck of tobacco. Sayward knew he had plenty of tobacco in his mink skin pouch. He just couldn't sit by all night while Asha bleated like a doe for water, and out in the run gallons of it were running to waste. When he went, he motioned Sayward outside. He told her she better expect the worst. One night last week, he saw corpse candles. Not often had he seen such things in the summer time. Mostly they came in a wet spell in the late fall, for that was just before the winter season, when old and young mostly died. These summer lights were over the old beaver gats. It had two of them bobbing up and down like fast to a string. He might have sneaked up close and seen faces in them, but he didn't want to know beforehand on whom death had fastened its mark. When Sayward came back in the cabin, she sent the younger ones up the ladder to bed. Matters crossed her mind now she never let herself think of before. It wasn't for nothing that the little cheeping birds stayed away from these deep woods. Slimy, clammy things that crawled or hopped you could hear night and day. Bullfrogs bawled and tree frogs screeched, but Sayward couldn't mind hearing a woods robin all year. Mostly the token bird called. He started in the morning before it was hardly light, Awk, 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 awk. He went and then flew to a new place in the woods to tell his bad news. You could hear him making all the rounds. He wasn't satisfied with the daytime. Sometimes he called like a death watch in the night. She recollected how Jerry used to say, Death would take the strongest and let the weakest be. Death was like the pair of black wolves Worth had once watched 
from some elk rocks in the Seven Mountains. They started a small herd of deer, and one of the does was poor. She couldn't go it with the others and fell behind. Those wolves could have got her without half trying, but it wasn't such a one they were after. They never turned a foot right or left from the main herd till they cut off a strong young buck, ripped his hamstrings, and fetched him down in the snow. Asha was stout and hearty, a young body as you'd want to find, and yet here she was, fetched down in her bed. It never bothered her to club the life out of a fox or coon caught in a trap. Now Jenny had to turn her face some other way. Asha could throw the young ones down on their backs and hold them with one foot on their breast, but hands and feet were not much good against death, and if you ran off, death was waiting for you behind a stump when you got there. Once Worth had gone, Asha didn't call for run water any more. She might work on her father till he gave her what wasn't good for her, but she had no such hopes with Sayward. She just lay like a lump of ore melting in a forge. Her cheeks were stained with pokeberry juice, and she panted faster than a hound. Mostly, she stared up with bright, gelled eyes at the loft boards, as if her bed up there was mighty far away, farther than she would ever go again. Sometimes she would leer at Sayward with bitter eyes. Oh, she would ask no favor of her oldest sister. Her mouth was shut hard. If die, she must. Die, she would. Worth didn't come home, and Sayward woke up that night in his bed. Something was outside. The fire had died down. The cabin was black as charcoal, but she could hear this thing crawling over the ground. It sounded heavy and chinked like a musket or kettle. She thought she had barred the door, but now it opened and the thing came painfully in. Only when it crawled on the leaves of the other bed did it come over her what it was. If they wouldn't fetch her any water, Asha must have reckoned she would take the small kettle and lug it to the run herself. Sayward lay in her dark bed and spelled this out. It was no use locking the stable after the ox was stolen. Likely Asha had already sucked her fill, pressing her hot face down into the cool run. Twice she heard her sucking greedily at the kettle. She thought, let her have her run water now. It was little enough while she lived. Worth could come home now and sleep in his bed. Asha would not likely plague him for water again. Sayward only meant to half doze after that, but when she woke it was late. Gray light came through the oiled paper window. She saw what had roused her. Jenny was backing down from the loft, staring around at the empty kettle beside Asha's bed. Her face was mighty sober as if looking on a corpse. A splinter in the ladder caught Jenny's skirt and lifted it as she came down. The bound boys a thinkin' a you, Jen, Asha jeered in her heavy voice. Sayward expected she better get up. It sounded like Asha would want some breakfast this morning. She wouldn't be surprised if Asha overed it now. Only passing the bed, you could smell that she was soaked with sweat and still sweating. There was one thing it looked like that could stand off death. If your time hadn't come yet, it made you slick 
as an eel, and death couldn't hold you, not even if you lay at death's door, burning up with a fever, and swilled yourself with cold water at the run. No, Asha's time hadn't come yet. The Lord might have something he had in mind for her to do first. Chapter 12 The Cabin in the Shumac Wyatt and Sully seldom came this way, if the cows were willing. They didn't talk much about it, but it had a place on this path they hated to pass. You went down a long dark hollow, a little run from a spring slimed across the path. Up that run stood a deserted cabin, all grown up with sumac. Its logs were black with age and weather. Once there must have been a little clearing around it. One time smoke had pushed out of that chimney and human feet pattered about. Now you could hardly tell humans ever lived here. A pair of hickory saplings had rammed up through the bark roof like it belonged to them. No engine ever set up that cabin worth told them, unless it was a white engine. How can you tell why it wanted to know? It has a lilac tree in Nyar. A lilac tree away back here. Jenny's voice came out almost like Jerry's. I stopped by today and seed it myself. Worth nodded. The Shawanese say it's Louis Scurra's place. You know the one where used to be with Simon Gertie. All the young ones stared. <clears throat> when they were back in Pennsylvania, Jerry would say, Don't you do this or that, or Simon Gertie will get you. Every young woodsy knew that Louis Scurra was mighty near as bad. For hadn't he been a boy with Gertie the time the Indians burned Colonel Crawford at the stake? Hadn't he used to stand as a little tyke, white and naked in the Ohio River, and call piteously for arks and keelboats to come to shore and pick him up? And all the time Gertie and his Delawares lay behind trees, waiting to massacre every one. They say Skura had a woman a livin' with him in that cabin, Worth went on. The Shawanese called her the white-faced girl. He fetched her up from Virginie. She died on him one time he was off to the English lakes. But her lilac trees still a livin'. One time, Sully let Wyatt go on with the cows and crawled through the sumac to see the lilac tree. The cabin stood still and dark as if no human had ever walked or talked inside. The door was down and a copper snake lay coiled up on the doorstep, looking in waiting for a deer mouse or some foolish small creature just off the nest. Sully kept her eyes off its ugly arrow head so that it couldn't put a spell on her. She knew Wyatt would tell her she had ought to have killed the snake. Now she had let her worst enemy get away for a whole year to plague her. She wished she hadn't come but she had to see that lilac tree. A stale, dank breath came out of the cabin, like out of the white-faced girl's grave. Sully didn't take a look around for any grave. It got dark early in the woods, and she'd heard tell of humans who came out when they couldn't rest in their berry hole. Not humans that lived good lives and did what was right. No, they would wait for resurrection morn. 
nor folks that had worked hard and were all played out. No, they wanted a good long rest. You never saw Jerry, no matter how often one of them had to go out at night, and her grave only yonder from the cabin. Jerry had been an old woman of thirty-seven, and mighty near tuckered out. Now, this white-faced girl was young and likely full of life when they put her underground, and such would get plenty tired lying in one place so long. In the short time she stayed, Sully didn't see any lilac tree, but she found a bush nearly choked back to the ground in front of the cabin. The little that was still green had smooth, tender leaves like none she had seen before. You could tell plain enough this wasn't a wild thing the way it stooped down and pinned away out here. She smelled at the lone, scrawny bunch of flowers and reckoned this was what the white-faced girl had liked to smell. She wanted to break it off and take it along back for the rest to smell at. But the ugly old cabin watched her out of its dark eye. She was glad just to get out of the sumac herself and run after Wyatt and smell again the good stable smell of Miss Covenhoven's cows. When she and Wyatt passed old Scurra place after that, Sully's mind, mind ran right to the lilac tree. She wondered, was it still living? But she didn't go in to see. It was close enough just to pass on the path with Wyatt for company and all the cowbells chiming sociably on the smothery air. Most times when the cows fed up this far, Wyatt drove them home another way. Tonight it hadn't much daylight left, and Sully could see he was letting them take the short path home by the cabin in the sumac. The cows saw it first. The black one with the bent horn stopped dead in the path, and right away the bells slacked off and hung mighty still. Cows and young ones all stared. What they saw looked like a Shawnee with his rifle on a head. The cows didn't want to go at all now, and Wyatt's shock of sandy hair raised up defiantly at this body who knew no better than stand in the path and scare his cattle. He had to lay the gad on hard to get the cows started again. They moved a little closer by fits and starts. Sully could see now it was a white man standing easy and pert as if he didn't care if he turned your cows off in the brush or no. The rifle stock under him was of curly maple striped crosswise, like a tiger cat. It was finished up fine with brass, and Sully reckoned Wyatt would stop to stare at it. But Wyatt's eyes were working on something else. Then she saw it too. Through the trees, faint gray smoke was rising, like a wraith from the old chimney of Louis Scurra's cabin, whose cows are them the stranger wanted to know. Coven Hovens, Wyatt fetched out, not looking at him. I heard it had a settlement here. The man looked from one to the other with his light blue eyes. He was a stocky fellow, not as big as worth, but his back was up and his chest out like a young cock pheasant. Anybody could see you didn't want to cross him. Covenhoven, you say your name is. My name's Luckett, so's hers. Wyatt answered him. All the time he was edging sidewise to get by and after the cows that had pushed through the brush. Behind him, Sully was doing the same. 
she had her head down, and a body might expect she was out of her wits, but nobody could have measured the distance better, so she was just out of reach of his grab. One move from him, and she would dive in the brush like a rabbit. After that, the wolf could run her hard as he liked, but he would have to run harder than she could. In a minute, she was past him, and though she kept her face down, she hadn't missed a lick about him. Her father's hunting shirt was a loose frock that came halfway down over his hams. More than once, she had seen him work it, on stiff and cold of a morning. It had sleeves full enough to make her a shift apiece, and it folded part way around itself when it belted. That's the way it was meant, so the bosom had slack to stow away, bread and jerk to eat, and toe to clean the rifle barrel, so the lead could sing true. But what this scurra had on was a shirt tight and fancy, capped and beaded, fringed and trimmed with fur that might have been mink and might have been, for all a person knew, the trimmings from the scalp of some poor white girl who had hair soft and brown as Jenny's. The shiny buttons likely were melted down, from pewter out of some great folk's cabin, he and his Indians burnt, and his cape was lined with raveled cloth, red as the human's blood, that had run plenty times from his knife. Is he a follerin? Wyatt asked when they were passed aways. I can't hear nothing. Sully didn't turn her head to see. If it was Louis Scurra, he could track them like an Indian, and it didn't matter where he set his foot down. He could come through dead leaves, and you could no more hear or see him than a catamount that has hair growing on the balls of its paws to shush its noise. We're off from him now, Wyatt told her. You don't need to be afraid. But if Wyatt wasn't afraid, what was he gadding the cows so hard for? They went skidding and belling up hill and down. Their heavy bags bounced this way and that. Miss Covenhoven would give them Jesse for churning buttermilk. No, neither of them could get out of these woods fast enough tonight. Covenhoven's log barn looked mighty good pushing gray and round out of the trees. Miss Covenhoven's round, pocked face was almost pretty as she came sailing out with her two cedar milking buckets on her arms. Don't say nothing, Wyatt warned under his breath, and don't you run home till I'm ready. Sully waited first on one foot and then the other while he put down the walnut bars, letting the bawling cows in the stumpy barnyard. They must a smelt a painter tonight, he told Miss Covenhoven, grave as a man. You couldn't hold them back. He put up the bars. I guess now me and her'll go to our supper. He and Sully walked off together, straight and sober, in the owl light. Once they were out of sight on the other side of the log barn, their bare legs raced through the nettles and sweet annets on the path to be the first to tell it home. Worth listened to them a while. Go on and eat your supper. Then he broke out. I'll send that king's man off purty quick if he comes around. Was he light or dark-complected, Sully? Asha whispered up in the loft that evening. 
He looked like he slept with a hex. Solly snapped. You don't need to act so high and mighty. Asha stuck up for him. He was only a little tyke when the Delawares took him. He did no more than what they told him. I wouldn't mind getting a good look at him. Before June berries were ripe, Asha had her chance. They were sitting down to supper. Sully looked out of the door and saw those fancy buckskins with the red-lined collar that some called a cape coming up the path. It's him, she hissed, worth his stool halfway up to the trencher, darkened. Most of the young ones stiffened. Sayward went calmly along, getting supper on the table. She could stoop over a fire half a day, and when she raised up, her back would be straight as before. Now, since nobody else offered to, she went to the door her own self. Your pappy to home. The light-complected man outside wanted to know. He's to home, Sayward said shortly. Her coolness never abashed Louis Scurra. His hair might be curly as a young one's, but his light blue eyes could get ice in them mighty quick. That ice said plain enough, no girl or woman could keep him cooling his heels outside when he wanted in. He stepped onto the cabin floor and found Worth standing by the head of the trencher. How are ya? Skura said, strong and pleasant as a basket of chips. Evening, Worth answered him. George Roebuck said, I might come and see ya. Worth only made a grunting sound. I need someone to put a clapboard roof on my cabin, Skura went on. They said you had a frow and was handy with tools. Worth shook his head warily. I got no time to spare you right now. Sully expected Louis Scurra to flare up at that, for he was a fire-eater if she ever saw one. I can wait, he said, nice as can be, taking no offense. Nobody spoke right away. The visitor stood inside the door, easy and pert, as if he could wait all day. Around the trencher, the young ones didn't know whether or not to sit down to supper. The venison roast lay hot and smoking on its wooden platter. You could smell it all over the place. Oh, this was a hard spot for Worth to be in, for never did a woodsy turn a man away hungry from his door if he could help it. Rations are ready. Can you set down and eat? He bid, but he said it so forbiddingly and gave such a cold glance through his beard that no man could mistake his unwelcome. Thank ye, Louis Scarra said. Worth motioned with his bearded chin for Asha to give up her stool and squeeze on the bench. Then there were only the sounds of stools and bench legs being scraped up to the trencher and of air being drawn through wet, smacking lips, and of hunting knives and wooden spoons on the split puncheons. Worth ate with brief down jerks of his beard, stopping now and then to expertly carve out a fresh slice and hold it out on his hunting knife to some hungry body. Sitting in Jerry's place at the other end of the table, Sayward bulked strong and solid as Bars Hill that Sully and Wyatt had fetched the cows over this day. Jenny picked finicky at her rations like she always did, while Asha kept raising her dark young eyes at this man in the red-lined collar across the trencher. Sully watched him, too, while her young jaws worked on a piece of deer meat her father gave her. Here he was sitting at their own table, the white Indian who helped burn some of his own flesh and blood. Louis Scurra was only a boy then, they said, but he'd danced 
and howled around the stake bad as the Delawares. Some claimed Skara and Gertie hadn't dare to do any less in front of the Indians, and that's why they stuck burning sticks under that naked white man's skin and helped run a red-hot gun barrel into him and burned out his eyes, so Crawford had to stumble around stark blind with the smoke coming out of his sockets. But they had done it, hadn't they? And now one of that wizen-hearted pair had his legs under their trencher, eating Sayward's venison roast. If she had a knife like Wyatt, Sully told herself, she'd reach right under this trencher where her pappy couldn't see her and fix that white Indian. Supper over, he told Worth, he wasn't a king's man any more. No once he was big enough to know right from wrong. He had gone over to General Wayne's side, and Worth was taking it for gospel and giving in to him like he always did if a body worked on him long enough. Even Wyatt looked like he had taken the wrong sow by the ear and hadn't had need to run from him the other day if he hadn't wanted to. But Louis Scurra couldn't take in Sully. He tried to make up to her once, asking pleasant as could be how she got home that night with the cows. Her black eyes burned back at him like a wolf's pups. And when he laughed at her across the trencher, she made a face and bit her thumb at him. She had no notion her father would do anything, but he pushed back his stool and rifted sternly through his beard. You can go to your bed, Sully, he said. She made no motion that she heard except that she kept looking at Sayward. Sully, he raised his voice. She went for the loft ladder at that, but her bare feet hung back from rung to rung, long as they dared, her eyes measuring shrewdly how quick she could leg it up if he made for her. Once in the loft, she threw herself down on Asha's bed, with her head by the loft hole. It's too hot up here, she cried. I can't breathe. Well, you can come down if you mind, her father growled. She told herself she would never go down, not if she had to be nice to that bloody-handed turncoat. She could see him pull his tobacco pouch from his hunting shirt and hand it to Worth, and her father was taking it like he hadn't any spunk at all. Now they were lighting their pipes with a coal from the fire, she hoped Louis Scurra would burn his fingers. Now they were sitting back in a corner talking, and the smoke was swimming up over their heads like a white river that flowed uphill. It circled around the cabin, getting higher and higher. The cabin was Pennsylvania, and the white river was the Junita that had to go over the mountains to get out to the sea. The loft hole was the gap it had to come through. Now it came to the gap and flowed over the rifles of the loft boards. Here it went by her house. She could lay on the bank and drink from it, but it wasn't any of Louis Gura's river she drank from, only what came from the clay of her father. They were telling hunting stories now, and Louis Gura was bragging how he hunted out some fort for General Wayne. The Indians had it bottled up, but he kept the garrison in meat. The Indians were up in trees watching. They ambushed every man who left by daylight, and they wanted to get him the most, because he'd gone back on their side. But he went out of the saddle gate by night. Once I got in the woods without their seeing me, then I had as good a chance as them, he said. He, he'd stay out till he got game. 
it was winter time and he couldn't make an open fire at night or they'd see it. So he dug a hole in the ground with his tomahawk deep as the crown of his coonskin cap. He called it his coal pit. He filled it with crosswise layers of wrath. He kindled a fire in the bark with the back of his hunting knife and a flint from his rifle. He slept sitting up with the coal pit between his legs and his blanket around him. The fire under him kept him warm and on the coldest night he could blow it up till it made him sweat. From her place at the loft hole, Sully could see her father and Wyatt looking at him now with new respect, and Jenny had moved across the cabin to listen. Louis Scarra sat back easier and went on. Before he drew a bead on a buck, he always put a bullet in his mouth, then he'd load up quick to be ready if the shot fetched an Indian. He'd drag his deer to a tree to dress it, with his back to the butt and his rifle leaning up handy. Oh, he had been an Indian himself and knew how to give them the slip. He'd pack the four quarters in the hide so he could sling it on his back like a knapsack and tote it to the fort. The Indians found his coal pits and what was left of his deer. They called him No Man Can Kill Him. Little Turtle wanted to swap him squaws and ponies for his rifle, but he wouldn't part with it. He crossed the cabin to show that rifle to Worth. Not every day, he boasted, could you see one with a raised cheek rest. The cheek rest had to be cut out first, then the whole stock cut away from it. Sully wanted to call out loud. What scalped white man did he take that off of? But her father would bridge her for that. Jenny was looking at the rifle. Sully reckoned she'd look at it too. She climbed down the ladder. But the raised cheek rest didn't look like any great shakes to her. Though the stock had a brass patch box and Hunter's Moon inlaid in the curly maple. She'd sooner look at Jenny right now than any rifle. Never had she seen her sister so mortal pretty. Her hair was soft and brown as a pine marten tonight, and her skin white as a town lady. Even Asha kept staring at her, but Jenny didn't take notice. Her bright eyes watched this Louis Scurra in his pewter buttons and hunting frock, with the soldier cape. She listened to all he had to say, and when he told how he hadn't the heart to kill a she-panther and its kits he saw playing together like humans one day, she leaned forward. Ah, she came out soft-hearted before she knew it. If you'd like a painter kit, I'll get you one some time, Skura said, looking across at her. Jenny shrank back on her stool and reckoned shyly she'd like one if her pappy and Sayward wouldn't mind. Sayward didn't say she would and didn't say she wouldn't. She sat in a dark corner working buckskin for Wyatt's new breeches soft and pliable in her hands. You couldn't read her face, but Sully remembered she was the only one hadn't gone forward to make a fuss of the rifle. The little girl felt a sudden burst of tenderness for her oldest sister. She went over and sat close beside her on her heels. How long till you go back up west, Worth said. I aim to settle down, Skura told him. They say it has a lawyer here from the Bay State. I want to see him about rights to my track out yonder, a pretty place if you've seed it. Sully's young lip curled, but Worth nodded gravely. 
Skura filled his pipe and passed his tobacco again to the older man. I'll stop by some day. One of your young'uns might show me where he lives at. The boy'll take you and welcome, Worth nodded, stuffing his dark clay. Thank ye, Louis Skura said, touching his pipe with a bright coal, so that the glow lighted up his bold young features. If he's off with the cows, maybe Miss Jenny here can show me.